Hi everyone, I'm Dan Fullerton, and today I want to talk to you about moment of inertia, also known as rotational inertia. Our objectives are going to be to determine by inspection which set of symmetrical objects of equal mass has the greatest moment of inertia, to determine by what factor an object's moment of inertia will change if its dimensions are increased by a consistent factor, to calculate the moment of inertia for a variety of objects, and finally, to apply the parallel axis theorem to find moment of inertia for objects that are rotating through an area that's not their center of mass. So to begin with, let's talk about some types of inertia. Inertial mass, or translational inertia, is what we've typically been talking about. That's an object's ability to resist a linear acceleration. It's also it also correlates to how much stuff an object is made up of. Moment of inertia, or rotational inertia, on the other hand, describes an object's resistance to a rotational acceleration. Objects that have most of their mass near their axis of rotation tend to have smaller moments of inertia, and objects that have larger masses further from their axis of rotation tend to have larger rotational inertias. Inertial mass, translational inertia, we usually symbolize with an M for mass measured in kilograms. Moment of inertia is capital I, usually in kilogram meters squared. So that should get us started. But to really understand this, why don't we start by analyzing the kinetic energy of a rotating disk? If we have a rotating disk, and I'll put its center here, and it has some radius, capital R, if we want to know the kinetic energy of that disk, well, that's a little bit tricky because the disk has various velocities depending on how far you are from the center of rotation. So what we can do is let's take a little piece of the disk. Let's call that mass I at some radius of the disk, Ri, and some linear velocity, Vi. It's not quite so bad to figure out the kinetic energy of that little piece as one-half Mi Vi squared. But we can replace that V with omega R, the rotational velocity, times the radius of the disk. So this becomes one-half Mi times omega squared times Ri squared. So then if we want the total kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy, for that entire disk, all we have to do is sum up all of those little pieces of kinetic energy over all i. When we do that then, that becomes the sum over all i of one-half mi omega squared ri squared. As we look at this, the one-half is a constant, and the angular velocity is going to be the same for all the little pieces on the disk. So those are constants. We can pull those out of the summation. Therefore, our total rotational kinetic energy is going to be omega squared over 2 times the sum over all i of mi ri squared. Now we're going to define our moment of inertia. Capital I, then, becomes the sum of mr squared. So I can replace mr squared, sum of mr squared, with i, and I find out that my total rotational kinetic energy is going to be 1 half i omega squared. And look how similar that is to our translational kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared. So we look at this, we have the same 1 half, we go from mass to moment of inertia, and we go from velocity to rotational velocity. Just like when we did rotational kinematics, there's an analog to the translational variables. Let's see how we calculate moment of inertia. If I is the sum of mr squared for a set of discrete particles, we could also look at that as the integral for a continuous system of r squared dm. If we look at moment of inertia calculated for some common objects, I equals one-half mr squared for a disk of some thickness. For a hoop, it's I equals mr squared. I equals two-fifths mr squared for the solid sphere, or two-thirds mr squared for the hollow sphere. For a rod rotating about its center of mass, we have one-twelfth ml squared. But if you move that axis of rotation to the end of the rod, it becomes one-third ml squared. So again, you see a larger moment of inertia when you rotate it about its end, further away from the center of mass. 
it's harder to accelerate something in that manner. So let's see if we can't calculate some moments of inertia on our own. We'll start with a set of point masses. Find the moment of inertia of two 5 kilogram bowling balls joined by a meter long rod of negligible mass when rotated about the center of the rod. And we're going to compare that to the moment of inertia when we rotate it about an end. So let's start with the one in the center. In this case, moment of inertia is going to be the sum of all of our masses times the square of their distance from the axis of rotation. So that's going to be m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared. Where if that's r1, that's r2. Those are both equal to r. In this case, it's a meter long rod, so that'll be half a meter. We'll call this mass 1 and that mass 2. So that's going to be m1 5 times r1 0 0.5 squared plus m25 times r2, still half a meter, 0 0.5 squared, or I get a moment of inertia of about 2.5 kilogram times meter squared. Now over here, when we rotate the same object about its end, we're expecting a larger moment of inertia. That's going to be harder to accelerate in a rotational manner. So now, same formula, I equals the sum of mr squared, which is going to be m1 squared, or pardon me, that's going to be m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared. Now m1 is still 5, but r is 1 meter, 5 times 1 squared, plus m2 is 5, but its distance from the axis of rotation is 0, so that's 0 squared, or 5 kilogram meters squared. So it has twice as large a moment of inertia just by moving the axis of rotation. Let's try it now for a uniform rod. Find the moment of inertia of a uniform rod about its end and about its center. Well, to start these sorts of problems, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by defining a linear mass density, lambda, which is going to be equal to the total mass, capital M, divided by the length, L. If we do that then, as we go and break this rod up, if I go call a little piece of it dm, a differential of mass, at some position r from our origin, then I could say that dm, that differential of mass, is equal to the linear mass density times the length involved, dx. Now we can go about solving for this. If it's rotating about its end, about this point here, now we can use i equals the integral of r squared dm because we have a continuous object, but dm is lambda dx, so that's going to be the integral from x equals 0 to x equals l of our r squared, in this case that's x squared, times dm lambda dx. Our linear mass density, because it's a uniform rod, is constant then. That can come out of the integral sign. So our moment of inertia is going to be lambda integral of x squared dx from 0 to L, or lambda x cubed over 3 evaluated from 0 to L, which is going to be lambda L cubed over 3. Let's take it a step further, though. Lambda L cubed over 3, remember lambda equals m over L. I can substitute lambda equals m over L back in here for lambda. As I do that then, I find that the moment of inertia is going to be equal to, well, lambda is m over L times L cubed over 3. One of my L's is going to cancel out, and I'm going to get m L squared over 3, or 1 third m L squared, exactly what we saw on the earlier chart the moment of inertia for a uniform rod about its end. Let's do the same thing about its center and see what, uh, what we get different. As so we start over here now for it rotating about its center, we're going to have the same basic setup for our problem. I equals the integral of r squared dm, but our limits of integration now are going to be from negative l over 2 to l over 2, because we're starting in the center, rotating at about that point, and going in either direction. 
So as we do that, that'll be x squared lambda dx. And we can go right to the steps we had before where moment of inertia is going to be equal to, well, we once again have lambda over 3 times, now we've got our L over 2 squared to negative L over 2 squared. So that's going to be L cubed over 8 minus negative L cubed over 8 or lambda over 3 L cubed over 8 minus negative L cubed over 8 is going to be lambda over 3 L cubed over 4. But once again, lambda equals M over L. So if I replace lambda with M over L, I get a moment of inertia of M over L times L cubed over 4 pardon me, L cubed over 12 here. L's cancel out and I get 1 twelfth M L squared. Notice how much smaller our moment of inertia is when we're rotating it about the center of mass, exactly as we'd expect. Let's take another object. Let's do this through a solid cylinder. Find the moment of inertia of a uniform solid cylinder about its axis. Well, now we're going to define a volume mass density, rho, which is going to be equal to the total mass divided by the volume of the cylinder. So that's going to be total mass m, the volume of our cylinder. Well, we can get that from, imagine if we spread this out. The total mass would be the area pi r squared or pardon me, the total volume would be pi r squared, the top surface, times the depth, the length. So that's going to be total mass m over pi r squared l. The total differential of mass then, if we take this small slice hollow cylinder, and we're going to integrate from r equals 0 to some final r, so we're just going to take small cylinders, and we're going to keep expanding these little small cylinders until we integrate, add up all of the larger cylinders. Our differential of mass, then, is just going to be the shell of width dr times the area 2 pi rl. So we can write our differential of mass, then, is equal to 2 pi r L, the volume when you take one of those thin shells and spread it out, times that row times dr, the thickness of that little thin shell. Now we can go to our integration. Moment of inertia i equals the integral of r squared dm, our starting formula again, which in this case, because dm equals 2 pi rl, dr times that constant rho, we can say that i equals the integral from r equals 0 to capital R, our final radius of r squared times 2 pi r l times r dr. All right, a bunch of constants here that we can pull out. We've got 2 pi, that's a constant. We've got L, that's a constant, and we've got our rho. Oops, sorry, that's a rho, there's our R. So we've got the rho, the volume density, is also a constant because it's a uniform cylinder. So that becomes 2 pi rho times L integral from 0 to capital R of R cubed dr. The integral of R cubed is just going to be R to the fourth over 4. So that's 2 pi rho L r to the fourth over 4 evaluated from 0 to r or 2 pi rho L capital R to the fourth over 4. Now in order to get this into a more manageable form let's go back to our definition of rho here. If rho is m over pi r squared L let's put that back into our equation and find that I equals 2 pi times our rho, capital M over pi r squared L, times L, r to the fourth over 4. And we've got some simplifications we can do here. 
r squared here is going to leave us with an r squared up there. We've got an l, we've got an l, a pi, a pi. 2 and the 4 is going to leave 1 half. And I come up with 1 half. I'm left with m r squared. So there's the moment of inertia for a uniform solid cylinder. Hopefully these are starting to make sense. They really take a bit of practice to get down very well though. Let's take a look at one more theorem that's really going to help us out here. The parallel axis theorem says that if you know the moment of inertia of any object through an axis intersecting the center of mass, then you can find the moment of inertia around any axis that's parallel to that initial one. So if we call the axis through the center of mass L, if we know the moment of inertia through L, we can find the moment of inertia through L prime as long as L prime is parallel to L. Here's how it works. The moment of inertia through an object at a different, different, uh, different axis, I L prime is just going to be equal to I L plus we have the mass of our object times the dist distance from the center of rotation axis to the new axis squared. So if we know through the center of mass, we can find through a parallel axis. Let's take a look and see how this works for an object like our uniform uh, uniform rod. Find the moment of inertia of a rod of mass m and length l about one end of the rod using the parallel axis theorem. And we're going to start with the given, if you remember, that the moment of inertia through the center was 1 12th ml squared. So i through the center of mass was going to be 1 12th ml squared. So if we're now going to rotate it about its end, we're moving it over a distance of L over 2. That's going to be our D. So the moment of inertia about an end is going to be the moment of inertia through the center plus its total mass M times this distance L over 2 squared. So that's going to be 1 12th ML squared plus M L squared over 4. Well, 1 12th ML squared plus ml squared over 4, let's make that 3 ml squared over 12 is going to be 4 ml squared over 12, which reduces to ml squared over 3. Exactly what we were expecting as we derived this earlier through the calculus method. So that's how we can use the parallel axis theorem to easily find the moment of inertia through an object if we, at a different point than the axis of rotation through the center of mass. Nice, quick, simple way to do that, as long as that new axis is parallel to the original axis. Hopefully that gets you started with moment of inertia, rotational inertia. If you need more help or have questions, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks. Make it a great day.